Hello. In this video, I want to give you an introduction to the concept of market failure. You see, the market mechanism, where the market forces of demand and supply lead us to equilibrium price and quantity, can be used to allocate resources effectively in so many markets, but sometimes those market forces fail. They fail to deliver the best level of output for society. They don't lead us to the socially efficient level of output. And when we have market failure, it is, it is required for the government to intervene and try and correct that market failure in a variety of ways. And I'll deal with the correction of market failure in another video. But in this video, I just want to take you through six types of market failure, six ways in which the market forces, the price mechanism, the invisible hand, as Adam Smith called it, six ways in which this market mechanism fails us and fails to give us the best level of output, fails to allocate our limited resources efficiently. And one of the most significant ways that market fail failure occurs, and this is our first one here, is the creation of externalities. Externalities are external costs and external benefits which occur during economic activity but which are not considered by the buyers and sellers involved in the economic activity because external costs and external benefits affect third parties not the buyers not the sellers but third parties you see when we undertake to buy or sell something we only consider our private costs and benefits we don't give any thought to the external costs and benefits by ignoring external costs and external benefits, we lead ourselves through the market mechanism to the wrong level of output in a market. So, some markets that create negative externalities include the tobacco industry, alcohol industry, car use, all creating negative externalities because they create external costs and we get overproduction in these markets if we leave it to the market mechanism. And then there are industries like healthcare, and education and higher education which create positive externalities uh, but again if left to the market mechanism there would be market failure because these markets would underproduce and we would not reach a level of output that is socially efficient so externalities are a very large area of market failure secondly we have missing markets if we left certain markets to the market mechanism, the price mechanism, certain goods would never be produced. That's because everybody would be waiting for someone else to buy and supply the product. An example might be the light given from lighthouses, or a fireworks display, or traffic lights, or street lights. All of these goods are what we call public goods. They possess non-rivalry and non-excludability. Non-rivalry is a, is a characteristic of a good which means that when one person consumes the good it doesn't reduce the quantity available for others. Non-excludability means that once the good is provided for one anyone can use it and can't be stopped from using it. This creates the free rider problem which means that everyone would want to use the product but would wait until someone else has paid for it and then they could use it free. Consequently no one buys the product and the market would be missing from the economy if we left it to the market forces. Of course, government has to correct this and step in and provide it and pay for it out of taxation. Our third kind of market failure is asymmetric knowledge. Asymmetric knowledge. Asymmetric knowledge exists when there is a lack of symmetry or balance between the knowledge of the buyer and the knowledge of the seller. And the imbalance gets exploited and leads to a misallocation of resources. Most of the time this happens when the supplier has superior knowledge to the buyer and exploits their superior knowledge and causes the buyer to allocate more resources, that means spend more money, on the good than they should do than that is best for them. For example, uh, an unscrupulous dentist might tell his patient that he needs lots of dental work done when in fact not so much is really required, just to create business. The buyer of the dental services feels they have to trust 
the expert and so commits to a, to a lot of expenditure when it wasn't really necessary. We might also see this with lawyers or with car mechanics or with doctors and other kinds of businesses where the, 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 the seller is an expert and they exploit their superior knowledge, exploiting the imbalance or the asymmetry between their knowledge and the knowledge of the buyer who trusts them. It can work the other way when a buyer has superior knowledge to the seller. Um, if you're an expert in antiques and you wander into a junk shop and you find a very, very valuable chair uh, made by a very famous carpenter 300 years ago, but the junk shop doesn't know what it's worth and is selling it for just a couple of dollars or euros, uh, you could exploit your superior knowledge and uh, lead to a, a lower than correct allocation of resources. But, but it's not as common as the supplier having the superior knowledge. Governments will have to correct this, of course, and they do this with legislation that, that tries to deter uh, those with superior knowledge from exploiting their position. Um, the fourth kind of uh, uh, market failure I want to introduce you to is a lack of competition in the market. Uh, market. Some markets um, will have many, many suppliers in them perhaps uh, apple farming or potato farming, but some markets will gravitate towards a monopoly or a very concentrated industry with only a few suppliers uh, dominating the market. We call that an oligopoly. This can lead to problems and government understands that uh, when a monopoly is created they may exploit their market power, build up barriers to entry and it might lead to a lower, than quali a lower quality of good, higher prices, and of course a lack of choice for the consumer. And all of this is detrimental to consumer welfare. Also in oligopolies, there is a danger that the, that, that the powerful firms in the market, rather than competing with each other, may end up cooperating with each other to reduce consumer welfare. And that is called collusion, or cartel-like behaviour. And so the government has a series of laws and, uh, which it can use to threaten firms and even break up firms or prevent the creation of monopolies uh, through, through legal, system, through legal um, law, laws and legislation which will, uh, which will try and prevent that happening and prevent the problems associated with a lack of competition. Because government recognises that in most cases competition is good for a business, it maximises consumer welfare. Although there are arguments to say that monopolies are beneficial um, I have another video on that. We can talk about more dynamic efficiency with a monopoly. We can talk about enormous economies of scale, which lead to lower prices with a monopoly. And also we can draw upon Joseph Schumpeter's argument of creative destruction, that when monopolies are present, we get a rapid progress as would-be competitors leapfrog the technology of the monopolist and come up with something even better. But that's all in another video. Our fifth type of uh, market failure unstable prices. This particularly applies to commodities, any naturally occurring substance such as any agricultural product, but also minerals and metals and fossil fuels that we dig out of the ground. These are all commodities and they tend to suffer, if left to the market mechanism, they tend to suffer very unstable prices, much more fluctuations, rises and falls in the prices, um, frequently and to a greater extent than with manufactured goods. This happens for a number of reasons and it creates a particular problem. It creates a problem for the suppliers of these commodities because they cannot plan on any kind of, uh, with any certainty, on what revenue they're going to receive and that makes it difficult for them to plan their investment spending and it can lead to them even quitting the market. And because commodities are the base of everything, of course, that feeds into the price fluctuations of manufactured goods, although those prices don't fluctuate so much. So governments see this as market failure, the instability of these prices in commodity markets, and act to try and stabilise the prices, usually through a buffer stock scheme, or perhaps by establishing a price floor or a price ceiling uh, at which, uh, beyond which the price cannot, uh, is not allowed to go. But um, you can find more details about this in another video, but definitely the instability of the, of the prices of commodities and what it does to the suppliers uh, as they try and plan for the future 
Uh, and also added to that is that they have very inelastic supply, so they can't react quickly anyway to the change in price. All of this creates such difficulties that it is seen as market failure. The final, sixth type of market failure I want to introduce you to is labour market failure. Labour markets, labour markets should, supposedly according to economic theory and the market mechanism, we should reach a certain equilibrium wage and an equilibrium quantity and the market should clear and we should not have any excess supply of labour as the demand for labour and the supply of labour inter intersect at equilibrium price and quantity, equilibrium wage rate we say in the labour market. But clearly this doesn't happen. As I speak to you, uh, today, I know that Greece, uh, where I am, has an unemployment rate of 18.5%. That means that 18.5 people out of every 100 who wish to work can't find work. In Spain, it's even higher. What is it, 22-23%? Youth unemployment in these countries is up beyond 40% across the whole of the European Union. Uh, the average unemployment at the moment is 10%. It's 9% in the States. So clearly, um, Markets aren't clearing in labour markets at the moment. There is labour market failure. It's as if the equilibrium cannot be reached. And the reason for that um, is manifold. But there are certain reasons which, which, which point us towards a kind of market failure. One of those is the immobility of labour. Labour cannot always be where the jobs are. There is geographic immobility. It is easy for people to move always to where the jobs are. They have ties in certain areas. They have social ties. Their, their partner might be working in that area and it's not easy to move. Um, their children might be at school there. They have extended family there. They don't want to move uh, to where the jobs are in another region of their country. But they may not even be able to move. If they cannot sell their property in order to buy something where the jobs are, then they won't be able to move. It's a classic problem in Britain where people in the north of Britain who would be prepared to move to the south are unable to move because they, the price they would get for their house in the north of England would not buy them something equivalent in the south of England. It's not possible to move. That's geographic immobility. There's also skills immobility. Skills immobility is when you don't possess the right skills to fulfill the job. So in Britain there are a lot of unemployed coal miners, steel workers and shipbuilders, three industries that were big employers but have now utterly declined. These are skilled workers, but unfortunately the skills are not the skills that are needed in other parts of the country, in other industries in the country, like maths teachers are required, computer programmers are required. Well, we cannot take an unemployed steel worker from Sheffield and make them into a... And, 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 instantly replace them, uh, put them in a maths teaching position in London. It's not going to be possible. So maybe with retraining, maybe with relocating the industry, tempting industry to move to those uh, more depressed areas, um, are possible solutions. But this immobility, whether it's geographic or skills immobility, is definitely a reason why labour markets fail. Another type of failure in labour markets is discrimination, of course. And although there are laws to try and prevent discrimination, we all know that dis discrimination still occurs. That's racial discrimination, sexual discrimination, discrimination against people of certain ages, people with disabilities, um, and people of certain religions. These are all types of discrimination, and statistics show us that people in certain, of certain, with sharing certain characteristics, maybe of a certain uh, racial background, ethnic background, maybe of a certain age group, suffer from higher unemployment rates than the national average. This is likely to be due to uh, discrimination. Another form of discrimination exhibiting itself in labour markets is the inequality of pay between men and women. Even though there are laws that, that suggest that, 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 that enforce that that shouldn't happen. So attempts to correct this have not been entirely successful. But perhaps the, it's not government failure but because perhaps the, the, the uh, discrimination would be far worse if those laws didn't exist. It's another area of labour market failure. One further area of labour market failure is a lack of information. If people don't know where the jobs are, then they cannot fill those jobs. Um, and so that's attempted to be corrected by increasing the flow of information through job centres and government facilities that will alert people and websites that will tell people what jobs are available and where. 
So, um, so that covers labour market failure. So I think I've given you a taste of um, types of market failure. I mean, I'm a great supporter of the market mechanism, but we have to accept the fact that, that uh, the markets do fail to, give, to, deliver, to deliver what's best for society on many occasions. And it's up to government to step in and correct those market failures without as much as possible interfering with the, with the good side of, of what market forces can do, and that is to help allocate our, our, our limited and scarce resources. Government's failure would be when government attempts to correct the market failure and ends up with a, an even worse allocation of resources or achieves nothing at high cost. And you can argue and you can agree or disagree about how the governments go about correcting the market failure, but most, I think, of you would agree that market failure can occur if we leave things only to the market forces. And these six are the main types of market failure that we see in markets in our economy. Okay, thank you very much. And he presses stop.